Los Angeles Aqueduct, over 200 miles long, crossing immense desert, traversing rugged canyons, flowing through 164 tunnels and splashing down the cascades into the Los Angeles water distribution system, generating electricity along the way. The Los Angeles Aqueduct is one of the most incredible engineering undertakings in history. It's the supply that literally created the opportunity for Los Angeles to become the second largest city in the United States. All of it operating under that inescapable, inexhaustible pull of nature. Nothing is cleaner and nothing is greener than gravity. The aqueduct starts over 3,800 feet above sea level and it ends up around 1,400 feet above sea level. It's 233 miles long and it sounds like a long distance, but that amount of elevation is more than enough to make water flow. An aqueduct is basically a system of pipes and ditches and channels that get water from where it exists to where the people are. In California, our biggest reservoirs are the mountain snowpack, and they're usually hundreds of miles away from where people live. So we have aqueducts to get the water from the mountains to the people. Los Angeles began as an outpost on a dusty coastal plain. With only 15 inches of annual rainfall on average, the land had little prospect of becoming a great city. However, from 1868 to 1898, Los Angeles swelled from a town of 5,700 to a metropolis of over 100,000. While residents enjoyed the climate, water engineers worried about it. Fred Eaton and William Mulholland found the water Los Angeles needed. In thinking about how did the aqueduct come to be, we have to talk about Fred Eaton because Fred Eaton knew about the Owens River from the 1890s. He had been up there traveling, vacationing with his family and other people. He knew there was this river hundreds of miles away in an area of very low population that ran into an alkaline lake. Eaton and Mulholland were both engineers and highly placed Angelinos. Water had always been Eaton's top priority as mayor. After his term, Eaton convinced Mulholland to explore the Owens Valley with him. When he took Mulholland out there to scope out the land and to see this gorgeous, pure water running down the river, it just struck something in Mulholland's mind that this is something that we can do. Not only was there water available, but it was available to be delivered without having to do any pumping. This was the place, 17 miles north of the town of Independence. Mulholland looked at this location and knew what he saw, the spot from where water could flow all the way to Los Angeles. Collect the water here, and the aqueduct would be a gravity-only system. No pumps, no lifting, no energy use. The aqueduct's designers knew that the water in the Owens Valley represented not only a large new source of high-quality water, but also a large amount of potential energy due to the water's elevation. They made plans to take full advantage of the potential for hydroelectric generation by building a very gently sloped aqueduct that preserved as much of the water's elevation as possible. The aqueduct was originally built and designed to use the gravitational flow to bring the water from Owens Valley all the way to the city of Los Angeles. And as they looked at those drops in elevation, they determined that it would be ideal for generating electricity along the way. And so the power plants were built in conjunction with the aqueduct system and ended up supplying power during the construction of the aqueduct and also then bringing power into the city of Los Angeles. Along the aqueduct, there's the gravitational drops. So there's, there's steep elevations, and in between those elevations, we built these power plants. And the power plants is the water is going down inside of these aqueducts, and it hits the power plants and it turns the turbines. And so we generate electricity without using any other fuel. We use the water as the fuel source, and out of that generates the electricity that then feeds into the city of LA. The political gears went into motion. The Board of Public Service Commissioners obtained $23 million in 1907 and saddled Mulholland with a soaring goal. People came from around the world. People skilled in tunneling and, and, and other crafts came here because they heard about the work and they knew there would be a good job. They say that some workers came and worked for one pay period, found out how hard the work was, how hot it was or how cold it was, and they got their paycheck and we never saw them again. They chose the sites of reservoirs, power plants, and control equipment. Most challenging of all, the survey identified the obstacles. The deep canyons, the twisting curves, 164 tunnels added up to 51 miles of horizontal digging, mostly through hard rock. Engineering challenges they met and overcame were, were tremendous. One of them was 
digging a over five mile long tunnel through the San Andreas Fault to complete the work. They actually started that first. That was started one year before anything else because they realized if they couldn't get that tunnel done, then they didn't have an aqueduct. The five mile Elizabeth Tunnel is the biggest of them all and it takes the aqueduct through Goaty Hill from Antelope Valley to Leona Valley. As the aqueduct is flowing, the designers and builders came to canyons that they had to cross, and they had to decide whether to build a viaduct across the top at, at a high elevation or run the water in a pipe across the bottom. And they chose the pipe because it really wasn't feasible to build a viaduct that was eight or 900 feet high. That just couldn't be done. So when they came to a place like Jawbone Canyon, they took steel pipe, they put the water in as it's entering that canyon at a high elevation, the pipe goes down across the bottom, ends up at a lower point on the other side. So you're still using the downhill effect, the gravity effect, to get the water from one point to another across a canyon in a steel pipe. The Owens Valley, the Mojave Desert, the San Gabriel Mountains, a million and a half cubic yards of concrete, 61 miles of open channel, 97 miles of concrete conduit, 51 miles of tunnels, 12 miles of steel pipe, 8 miles of reservoirs, 233 miles in close to 6 years. November 5, 1913 was a day of celebration for a job well done and a shining modern future. The aqueduct reached its goal of transporting 300 million gallons of water per day. By 1941, the aqueduct was extended 105 miles further north gathering water from Mono Lake and four streams. The extension increased the aqueduct's flow by 35%. In 1970, the DWP opened a second parallel aqueduct right next to the 1913 original. The second aqueduct shares all the original's design elements and engineering principles, as if William Mulholland lived again through its construction. The aqueduct has been incredibly important in the past. It'll be even more important as we go forward, because as we look at the many variables of our water supply. This is one of those foundational pieces that we need to continue to build upon and know that we have as we deal with the scarcity of water all over, uncertainty with respect to climate change, so that we know that we have this foundational supply as we look to be more efficient with our water use, seek more local water supplies. Knowing that we have this here is critically important to us. Conservation became the order of the day. And in the last few decades, the Los Angeles Aqueduct's coasting gravity-powered principles are again timely. Water is now being left in the Owens Valley, both in Mono Basin, Owens Lake, and in the Owens Valley itself, for environmental purposes. We're refilling Mono Lake, we're rewatering the lower Owens River, we're controlling dust on Owens Lake, and we're enhancing the groundwater in the Owens Valley. So there's a lot of good environmental projects that are getting served by that water that we're leaving in the valley. Today, the Los Angeles Aqueduct still supplies about 40% of Los Angeles' water needs, and the San Francisco and Owens River Gorge power plants still contribute power to the city's grid. The aqueduct and the power plants along the aqueduct, while being about 100 years old, and there's a lot of history there, they're still vital to the city of Los Angeles. Going forward, they're filling the gaps of the intermittency of our renewable portfolios. So as the city transforms into using more solar and more wind, these power plants fill in the gaps. So instead of just flowing when the water flows, we keep the water from flowing and we use the water flow when we need the power. Wind power, solar power. Harnessing the natural forces of nature. In Southern California, the Los Angeles aqueduct led the way. Its age-old theory showed the path to a cleaner, more sustainable resource future. The Los Angeles aqueduct has been a part of the lifeblood of water to Los Angeles for a century. As we move forward in the next century, we know that we have to continue to be strong environmental stewards of the Eastern Sierra, use that water wisely, and to combine local water supplies on a sustainable basis collaboratively with this historic supply from the Eastern Sierra. It took energy to build the Los Angeles aqueduct, but like winding a grandfather clock, the Los Angeles aqueduct has coasted under gravity ever since, and will for another 100 years.